Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, how many of you think you're kind? Just put your hand up if you think you're kind. Okay, so there's nobody in here that's kind. How many think you're a little bit kind? Just, just, just like a smidgen kind. Okay, well here's how I'd like you to be kind. Put your mobile phones away, because you're loved but not that important that, that things can't wait for another 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, what you have to say can wait. What others have to say to you can wait. And I would appreciate it because I want to talk to you about joining a noble fight tonight. Um, it's interesting so much of the theme because the title of my message tonight, which will appear on screen, is um, an echo of uh, things that Jenny said um, earlier. Whenever you've got that title, we're having trouble tonight, aren't we? And that, I know why. Um, I, I need you. I need you to help me. In 1984, I had a vision. If you've never had a vision, that's ridiculous, isn't it, Jen? A vision. In a vision, you see things you couldn't possibly know by your own natural reasoning or understanding that turn out to be absolutely true. And this has happened to me just a few times in my life. One of the significant times was 1984. And the things that I saw in 1984 are happening now. And I can track exactly where we are in the process by some events that have happened this week as I've gone back and reflected upon those words. A lot of what happened in 1984 was a desire from God to do something that I don't know whether it sounds strange and ridiculous to you, but nevertheless I believe with God, which was to tear down the religious spirit over this city. We are currently struggling as a house because there is a religious spirit that is being torn down over this city and it doesn't like what we are saying. So I'm inviting you, sometimes, sometimes the goodness of a message is not sufficient to motivate a group of people to action. The strongest means of motivating people to action in psychology in the world is to share a common enemy. Now that saddens me a little bit that we become more motivated together when we share a common enemy because we should never need an enemy to unite us but I'm accepting the fact that all of us are a little defective as human beings and we, we give it nice terms if we could just have a cause what we usually mean by that cause is we have defined what is the enemy of what we are doing and we join together to defeat that enemy and we call it a cause so if it makes you feel better about us and about yourself to say, I am uniting to a cause, I invite you to do that. But it still is an enemy that we are fighting and it's reared its ugly head this week and I need to talk to you about it because all of us are involved, because our lives are involved in the issues that this represents for us. And so the idea of 70 times 7 is, is very important in this context and in the outworking of that vision. I believe we're at a critical point in the life of the Rock of York. I do not believe that the Rock of York is more important than any other church group in the city. I believe it is at least as important, but I believe we have an importance within the whole focus and process of the church in this city that if what we have to say is lost, then the city will remain under a vicious religious spirit. I don't know if you know, but there are more churches in this city that are splits from churches than there are churches which just originated in their own right. That means that groups of people come together and then don't get on for long enough to accomplish what it was that God really wanted them to do. I'm not happy about that. I'm glad that I've been in the same place now for 54 years. I've been in the same place since I moved to this city because my heart was to commit myself with my parents as a six-year-old child to what was important to them, which was first Christ and the true gospel, but then to the family, the community to which we were attached. 
And so I've served this community. I, I've served it in leadership roles since I was uh, 20 years of age. I've served in leadership roles. I've served as an unpaid worker in the church, as an assistant leader. I've served on full-time staff. Now, for over 30 years, 30-odd 30 years, I've been on full-time staff. And I've been a senior leader in this house this year for 25 years. And I believe God has a purpose. I believe I was here by events that could only be defined as a work of God. Now that doesn't mean I'm a special person who glows in the dark. I don't glow in the dark, but I am called and I am serious about where God has placed me. Now I don't believe you are called any less. And some of you have been in this journey as long as me or longer than me in this very house. But the thing is, this congregation is coming to the point where now we need to expand and grow out of what God is showing us rather than contract out of some of the condemnation and criticism that has come because of what we are being told. Now, you may think, is this appropriate for a Saturday night? Of course it is, because it's true. There is a great weight of conversation out there which is against this house, against me, and against this woman. There are criticisms and rumors and condemnations which are without foundation and are untrue, but are based solely in the fact that in this house we decided to forgive and restore to an extent that they feel is completely ridiculous. And so here's a few comments about that. My late father-in-law found faith in Christ after leaving a meeting, a church meeting, saying, if you're a Christian, I don't want to be one. I was in a meeting with some Christian leaders this week, and I felt after that meeting the same as my father-in-law. If you're a Christian, I don't want to be one. That sounds severe. It sounds harsh. And to some, you may think it's inappropriate. But it's time to call a spade a spade. It's time to do what Jesus did and said, we are not going to allow ourselves to be suppressed under a weight of condemnation that flows from a religious spirit to uphold a system but does not operate in this spirit of 70 times 7. In fact, I had a Christian minister leader say to me this week that to forgive a person twice for the same failure would be really stupid. Now, you say, did you imagine that? Graham, Byrne was, uh, Graham Grant was sat in the same room and Jenny Byrne was sat in the same room. And I was shocked to hear these words. I'm going to repeat them to you because I hope it shocks you as much. To forgive a person twice for the same failure would be really stupid. I think in that moment Jesus wept. I wanted to weep in that moment. I could not believe what I was hearing. The reason I'm raising this is that if that is at the core of some of the gospel that is being given to some of the people, that is not the gospel of the Jesus of Abba, and it's not the gospel that I will agree to. I sincerely hoped that the shaming culture had died out from church life, but apparently not. I experienced that this week, and it makes me very sad. The church was not created to shame people because of their behaviors. It was here to change people because of its love. Yeah. Now Jenny and, and Graham and myself were told this week, and Jenny's mentioned it, that we, we and we are not normal. You've got to understand, you guys are not normal. This is because of the extent to which we believe and practice love, grace, and restoration. And in that case, then, I am honored that I would be called not normal. I wear that badge with godly pride because if, if, if to not be normal means to not practice love to its full extent and grace to its greatest degree and restoration to all, then I do not want to be normal. I want to be not normal. One thing I will say about that is that, that bad days are made better by good friends. And, uh, and, and, and I express now my incredible thanks to, to Graham Grant and, and Jenny Byrne um, for their friendship who stood by me and with me and for me this week and have, have represented you in a wonderful, wonderful way in this city, represented the message 
represented it with grace and with kindness, never rose to criticism and accusation, were not provoked to anger, but spoke with love and generosity and kindness and simply told the truth. And I'm very proud of these guys and very, very appreciative that I had them with me this week. Because I can never and will never submit to a system which defines people according to their sins and cannot rejoice and celebrate when mercy triumphs over judgment and grace over condemnation. I remain constantly aware of the revelation God gave me from the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, where the religious people said, in Moses' law it is written, we should stone this person. They were actually correct. They weren't wrong. If you were going to go by the letter of the law, they were absolutely correct. But Jesus seemed to differ with their view of how this should pan out. Jesus had a different vision of the end of this story. It did not leave a bloody woman dying in the dirt, in the desert, for the vultures to pick her bones. Jesus had a different view in mind of how this would end. And so the story is that Jesus wrote some things on the sand and he said, let the one who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. I think that should echo through our lives every single day with everything that we meet, every person we encounter, even when we're in the grossest of situations and nobody's minimizing that there are things that we do in life which are painful and destroy ourselves and destroy others, but let him who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Now, I am in what some would call a profession. I would rather call it a calling than a profession. My greatest sadness is to witness when people in my profession feel because of their connection to the Bible and to the work of God that somehow they are positioned to pick up a stone and cast it at a person who they think is in sin. I'm so glad in this story that they were sensible enough at least to realize that what Jesus said, there were no get outs. Like Jenny said, forgive 70 times 7, but if you go to the 490th, then you realize he said love keeps no record of wrongs. So who's in the wrong, the one being judged or the one doing the judging? What I learned about this story, and this sticks with me now so tremendously, is it said from the eldest to the youngest of those who were condemning this woman for her sin, one by one they walked away till only Jesus was left with the woman. And Jesus turned to the woman and said, where are your accusers? Does nobody condemn you? And she said, well, it looks not. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. We balance the story on that. For me, the story has a deeper meaning. That woman should have never been left alone to hear those words of Jesus. If those people truly embraced that they themselves were not without sin and that what they were doing may have been correct in drawing attention to an issue that needed to be resolved but not with the spirit that if we can get rid of the person we get rid of the problem which is the spirit that often prevails if we can get rid of the person we get rid of the problem so let the church get rid of the person the church gets rid of the problem Jesus never wanted to get rid of the person he wanted us to embrace the problem so here's my take on John 8 when Jesus said let him who is without sin be the first to cast a stone instead of one by one walking away they should have one by one walked to the woman until now all the crowd that were once stood there accusing now share in the condemnation of the woman we all have sinned we have all come short So Jesus, will you speak to all of us whatever it was you were going to speak to this woman? And he would have then said to them, okay, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Now all of you, go and sin no more. Go and work at this. Go and receive something from this. And so I am aware of that and consciously aware. It it drives me in, in, in how I see things working out in the context of the gospel. 
And so I want to come to one other chapter, Matthew chapter 18 in the New Testament is the chapter that's most quoted by leaders and by people raised in church in the context of church discipline. We actually were told this is how church discipline must be worked. I say amen to that, but not in the way that it is interpreted through that spirit that still says we need to get rid of the woman and then we can get rid of the problem. May I also say at this point, Jesus never called the woman an adultery, he always called a woman. Here's the other problem in the church. We define people by their sin. So we call people what their behavior is. So we don't see a person as a woman, we see her as an adulterer. We don't see them as a young person, we see them as sexually promiscuous. We don't see them as Bill, we see him as the drug addict. Okay? We don't see so-and-so as this, we see them as gay. Okay, Jesus did not refer to people under the label of the issues of their life. I'm glad because if the secret things of our lives were what we were to be called, some of you would be more embarrassed than you would expect to be tonight because suddenly you would be being called by the things that people haven't seen and don't see, that we thought were covered up. The wonderful thing about the gospel is he calls us by name. It's always by name. Why? Because he does not associate you with your sin. He doesn't associate you with your failure. He associates you with his love. He associates you with his mercy. And the other stuff is just an issue to overcome in the context of that exceeding love and exceeding mercy. So I'm going to jump through Matthew 18, the quickest I've ever done in all of my life. It starts out with the classic striving for greatness scenario. Who is the greatest? And we may be so humble that we think we're the most humble person in all the world, and we're proud to be humble, but actually for all of us there is a striving for greatness. We, we, see, we don't realize, but just the need to be loved more is a striving for greatness. I'd like greater love. I'd like, I'd like greater acceptance. I'd like greater approval. I'd like, I'd like a greater friendship. Are all striving for greatness. That's where all the problem usually starts in that striving for greatness. And this starts here. And it moves on to the inevitability of offences. And he adds some strange words to this and talks about cutting off hands and cutting off feet and gouging out eyes, which, you know, get your head around that one. All about trying to to, 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 to deal with the issue, what it's really saying is that it's pretty hard that we shouldn't offend people. It's pretty hard. You'd have to cut off your hands, your feet, gouge out your eyes if we weren't, if we weren't going to get offence out of our world. Now, the Greek word that we translate offence is the Greek word scandalon, which you don't have to be a Greek scholar to have a rough guess at which English word comes from Scandalon, it's the word scandal or to scandalize. Jesus was saying there will be scandals. There'll be scandals in your life. There'll be scandals in your head. There'll be scandals in your job. There'll be scandals in your country. There'll be scandals in your politicians. There'll be scandals in your preachers. There'll be scandals in your Christians. It is inevitable that scandals will happen. The issue was not whether they would happen, but what you're going to do about it when they do happen, okay? That's the issue. And to hopefully not be the cause, but if you are, there's still grace for that. And so then in verse 10 through 14, he moves on to talk about lost sheep. But he says something really remarkable. In verse 12, he says, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep... And one of them goes astray, so we've got a hundred sheep, one of them's gone astray. We've got a straying sheep, okay, just one straying sheep, okay. He says, does he not leave the 99, go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? We have a straying sheep, have you caught that? A straying sheep, have strayed from the path, have strayed from the way. And verse 13 says, and if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, or in other words, you better get this, I say to you, he rejoices 
more, catch that, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Now, I would propose to you that the 99 are probably deceived anyway. But can you see more? He rejoices more over the one that went astray. The message here is we may struggle over our position where we think greatness has been taken from us, where we think something in life has been denied us, where we've grabbed for something in life and then we've got into places where we've experienced scandal on whatever front that is and he puts it like a sheep that's strayed and the 99 can look on and go, huh, well you've got 99, who cares about that one? If we get rid of the woman, we get rid of the problem. If we get rid of the sinner, we get rid of the problem. Jesus said, no, here's the deal. We go after the problem, because if we can restore the problem, we've achieved more in the restoration of one than we have with the 99 that think they're okay. So is the great testimony we kept 99 safe, or is the great testimony we saved one? Now, I want you to bear in mind, this is not a wild evangelical, you know, someone out in the world. We all, the, the hundred were already in the flock. They were in the fold. We're talking about scandal in the fold. And we're talking about he rejoices more. Or in other words, when God sees a scandal resolved, when he sees a person restored, when he sees mercy triumph over judgment, he goes crazy. He's more excited about that than 99 people coming in all in their nice order, pretending that nothing is wrong, having the law and saying, if it ever happens here, in Moses' law it's written, and we're going to do the stoning. So he moves on into verse 21, which is where we bring this to its close. What to do if your brother, or we're going to put sister in there as well, sins against you? This is what to do if your brother or sister sins against you. Maybe if is the wrong word there. What should you do when? When? Now, here's kind of what the human mind says if you start thinking about it over coffee. Depends what they've done. I beg to differ. You see, once we create a gospel that depends what they've done... We've now made a point system and categorized sin, so therefore we believe some people are worse than others, therefore they need more grace than others, and therefore it means that some things are kind of okay. So we run a kind of Christian white lie system, but we don't call it that. And yet evangelically we'll say, you have to break just one law to be a lawbreaker. A lawbreaker is a lawbreaker whether they break a hundred laws or one law. Our evangelical theology tells us if you break one law, you've broken the whole law. Because all have sinned to the same degree. But somehow in practice we lose that because of our lack of love for people and missing the 70 times 7 principle and start to categorize sins, label people with their sins and then determine that somehow we can treat them differently because their sin is worse than our sin. Let him who is without sin be the first to cast the stone. It's all the same. And so what do we do? So Peter comes to him, verse 21. Lord, how often shall I forgive my, how often shall my brother or my sister sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, feeling pretty proud. A bit like the, what I experienced this week, sadly, didn't reach to seven, it just reached to two. I'm going to repeat to you again, I want this, you, you cannot... This has staggered me to sit in a room and hear this said. If a person, particularly in leadership, does the same thing twice, you would be stupid to forgive them. I'm I'm repeating it because I still can't believe I heard it. But I know it's the expression of that spirit that I, with all my heart, passionately, am here to break for the sake of the kingdom of God. It is not appropriate 
So Jesus said to him, verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but I say to you up to 70 times seven. Right? 70 times seven. Or in other words, an immeasurable number of times is when you forgive. The call of Christ is to forgive your brother or sister whatever they have done 70 times seven. It's not something you debate, it's something you do. Now here's the problem. When forgiveness becomes a debate rather than an action, we become more like the Pharisees wanting to storm the woman than the Jesus who wanted to free her. Forgiveness is not a subject that you debate. Forgiveness is an action that you do. And there's too much talk about who should be forgiven, how much should they be forgiven, how many times, what constitutes an arena where we kind of forgive you, but you can't ever be what you were before. Then it's not forgiveness. The call of Christ is to forgive your brother or sister 70 times 7. Not something you debate, it's something you do. And after the events of this week, I have been looking for the scripture that says three strikes and you're out. Or if you're a leader, two strikes and I can't find it. But that's the gospel I was exposed to this week in a church context. Three strikes and you're out. Two if you're a leader. I can't find it in the Bible. If you know where it is, please help me where that scripture is because I sure as heck can't find it. See, the purpose of forgiveness, while presenting opportunity for the other to experience the restoration you are offering, is actually to free you from the prison you are held in by your unforgiveness. That dark place of bitterness and resentment that poisons everything you think and do. No justice or retribution will ever leave you truly satisfied or restore your peace. Only forgiving someone will. So I propose to you forgiveness is actually not really when we come away from God about the other person. It's actually about you. It's about you coming out of your prison. Now, some of you say, well, how can I ever forgive the things that have happened in my life? How could I ever... Well, well, well let me say this, that, 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 that why would Jesus ask us to do something that was not possible and was not blessed by the hand of God? I propose to you that when you make the decision that I'm going to be a 70 times 7, that I'm going to forgive because I'll never have peace... Because retribution will never bring me peace. Forgiveness will bring me peace. I propose to you when we make that decision, something happens from heaven that brings peace in the heart and says, let it go. We have been the passive victims of the most horrible accusations for the last 10 years. But we have let it go because we've walked in forgiveness. Now you say, well, you're obviously not forgiving now. No, we're still in the same forgiveness. If we can walk together 10 minutes after this meeting, I will do it with an open and full heart. I am absolutely, forgiveness is there. This is not an issue there. It's an issue of we will not tolerate a message that does not bring the forgiveness of Christ and the mercy of God to people's lives. And that's what I'm fighting for now. So if I can't get you on side because of what I'm for, I'm now trying to get you on side because of what I'm against. Okay? We'll see which works best. The final verse in this little section is the, most, the one most distorted verse in all of its interpretation. And it's verse 17 and the last half of verse 17. Just, just run me back to verse 17. This is the most distorted verse, okay? But if he refuses, so we've, we've now gone back, we've gone on all this, we've now gone back to, to, to correcting people. And it says, challenge them, talk about it. If necessary, bring it on this level and talk about it here. That's okay, I have no problem with that. What I have then the problem with is the final interpretation of most people because it says if he or she refuses to even hear the church, and bear in mind that sometimes we work with people who it took them 10 years to get into something, 
And we want them out in a minute. Now, I believe the grace of God can break every stronghold. I believe that God can change, change desires and dimensions. But my actual experience says forgiveness comes in a moment, but walking out of what took you ages to walk in often takes as long to walk out of it as it did to walk into it. That's where forgiveness and grace really works. See, because if I can say I forgive you and, and everything's changed, that puts no pressure on me. But if I say I forgive you and it might take us five years to get to where we need to be, or seven years, or eight years, or ten years, is there a 70 times 7 forgiveness that says all the way, all the way, all the way, never leave you, never forsake you, just like Jesus did with his disciples? Even when one of them rebuked him for the stupid idea and suggestion that he would die and rise again. Matthew 16, Peter. He forgave them. So listen to this. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, here's our John 8 interpretation that wants to stone the woman. There you go. We should have nothing to do with them. We can reject them. We can forget them. Or in other words, if we get rid of the sinner, we get rid of the problem. He's still driving the mind. Get rid of the sinner. Get rid of the problem. But you see, the question is, how did Jesus treat heathens? How did Jesus treat tax collectors? This is like, if you can't work it out, here's the deal. Keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep pushing on the door, keep hugging, keep being kind, keep affirming, keep forgiving, keep letting mercy triumph over judgment. And guess what the guy was who's, who is reported to have wrote this very book? Matthew was a tax collector. So he's saying, treat them like Jesus treated me. So even what seems to be a discipline, and it is, is so infused with grace that you never get away from the 70 times 7, 70 times 7, 70 times 7. So if you're still a heathen, and if you're still a tax collector, and they were the hated people of society, even after we've offered grace to you, we're going to still keep loving you. And we're going to still keep giving you a voice. And we're going to still seek glory in the mercy of God and watching the journey of that in your life. But will we reject you? No. Never. Not ever. So let me bring this to a close. There's a, a wonderful little verse in Proverbs 11 verse 24. That says, there is one who scatters yet increases more. And this is the bit I wanted. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Here's my interpretation of that. There is a withholding, a holding back that leads to poverty. Sometimes we can think if we hold back, if we protect our own purity, if we protect our own holiness, if we keep our money to ourselves, if we protect our own time, that somehow we'll have something. But the Bible says, no, you'll become poor. You'll become poor, we'll become poor. We'll all be the poorer because of what we withhold. And in this arena of forgiveness, we are the poorer as the body of Christ for what we have withheld. And we will burst into richness when we don't withhold anything in the context of forgiveness. 70 times 7. Let's treat those who are not ready to move as heathens and tax collectors, but 70 times 7. So we're going to finish. Every person is a person of great value in the eyes of God. Every person. Never defined by what we did or didn't do. In grace and disgrace. In honor and in dishonor. Every single one of us is of great value in the eyes of God. And one can only presume if there's any integrity in the words of Jesus that his attitude towards our weaknesses is a 70 times 7 attitude. So here's where we finish. Today he calls you into the power of that love and all of its power to transform you. This is the heart of this house. It's been my journey through all these years. It's the thing that you need to know we are deeply and aggressively criticized for and shame is brought on the name of this house. We forgive where that has come from. But we will not back down. We will not change our direction. 
We will not stone anybody for the sake of the mob. But what we will do in Jesus' name is sit with every accused. And sit with one another in this house. So that all of us under the grace of God can hear him say, I don't condemn you. And we to the best of our ability can go and sin no more. What is the greatest sin? The greatest sin is to diminish and undermine the extent of the love of God. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. To undervalue and devalue his love is a greater sin than any sin we could ever have. Because it's to undermine and devalue God himself. For God is love. And those who love are the servants of God. So, it's been a quite a hard, hard message, but I am calling you to the fight to redeem this gospel in this city. That what happened in that vision that I saw years ago, and knowing that we're at the point of where there has been violence against us, not physical, but emotional and dialogue and written, to know that the next of the prophecy was that there would be a light that would come out of this house. It's not a better than, it's not a greater than, it's not a more than, it's just a light. A light to say something. You guys are the bearers of the light. And we must fight for the right to be the light. Yeah? In the 70 times 7 spirit. So I bless you. Right now, Father, I pray that on every heart that has been in the prison of unforgiveness will know the wonderful joy of release. That we can then deal with the issues that are important without wrestling all the time in our starvation to survive in the prison of our own darkness because of unforgiveness. I thank you that forgiveness flows when we choose to stand in your grace and forgiveness for us. So I pray today for everyone who is struggling in that area that it will flow in Jesus' name. And I also pray you break every last bit of the stinking religious spirit and legalism that hangs over our heads, that we will be a 70 times 7 people, and that we treat everybody as you would treat the heathen or tax collector, which is absolutely the best place to be. But that would be our spirit all the time, because it's my desire in this city that your kingdom come, and your will be done here on earth, like it is in heaven. And bless the people across our city who are struggling to grasp this right now and help us to bring light into their lives because we want to share in the wonder and the glory of this as you have revealed it in our own lives and been so gracious to us because we believe that mercy triumphs over judgment. And we believe that grace is stronger than condemnation. So help us to feel that spirit tonight, walk in it, and every life be transformed as we see the Abba of Jesus revealed afresh to us and walk in the light of that calling in Jesus' name. Amen. We're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all The Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.